So I am probably a slightly different kind of artist than the people that have been coming here to talk. Maybe not, but you'll figure out why once I start showing some of my earlier works. Um, does anybody know what this is? No. So uh, it makes for pretty cool prints, and I've been trying to get them out into actual like screen printed. Um, but uh, these are actually the insides of integrated circuits because that's what I designed for about five years after I left college. Um, this is a picture of me in grad school, and that's, I guess, what I was doing. <laughs> but if I read that now, I don't really understand um, what exactly what we were I know what we were doing, but you know, when you write for, for conferences and things like that, you always have to make it like the fancy version and then send your picture in with it. Um, I never had hair like that f longer than <laughs> whatever it took to get that picture taken. Um, and there was a version of that that had the American flag in the back to try to you know, scare people into accepting our work into conferences and stuff. Which, despite uh, the American flag on the picture and what I'm wearing, I'm from Brazil. I, uh, I went to school and worked in the U.S. for a little bit, and that's why I have this accent, but hopefully everybody can understand and follow, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I uh, studied and worked as an engineer for four or five years, and it was okay. It was interesting for a while, but um, the work itself got to be very, very specific, and the kinds of stuff that I had to do and how I applied my knowledge was super, super specific. And the other thing that was happening at the same time is that um, the internet or technology was also becoming more of a public thing, like a, um, how do you say it? Not, not a product, but yeah. When I started school, this is what the internet looked like in the late 90s. And this is what we thought it was. Uh, in our heads, it was like, wow, I can connect to whatever and talk to people just like me. And we can like uh, design websites and to like use the internet and program the internet was kind of the same thing. Um, and then <coughs> by the time I finished school, um, this is what the internet looked like. It was Facebook and Twitter. And it, it, I stayed in school for like seven years. That's why. <laughs> Um, and some of the people that I went to school actually were the ones behind doing a lot of this stuff. Um, and so that has always been sort of in my, the back of my mind, sort of like, oh, I have this lineage, you know, this DNA, uh, academic DNA that leads to things like this, but I kind of like this a lot better. So, <laughs> um, and then beside boxes, just sort of this, you know, simplified kind of interactions now that we, uh, that we have to connect to other people, but just mediated through glass and plastic and screens. And the way that I like to like think about Tinder, nothing against Tinder, but if you think about evolution, right? Like how long did it take us to develop the thumb? So then, <laughs> so we can mate like this. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> um, and so thinking about how technology is sort of marching and um, becoming more and more of this like standardized interfaces and processes is, oh, and then this also happened um, recently, but, or this became public recently, but we already kind of knew that it was happening all along. <laughs> Um, and so, both this, um, ah, sorry, so this is one of the slides that was leaked by Snowden um, that shows when certain companies became part of their PRISM collection program. And so pretty much all the companies that make the technologies that we use are providing our data to government agencies. Um, and, and again, like if you, you know, like I was in academic, uh, in my academic life, I was sort of 
we, we could guess that this was happening, it kind of knew. We always had government people coming in and out. That's who funds most of the research, even robots that are there to like play football. There's always a screw mount to like put a gun on it, you know? So it's like, <laughs> cool. But, um, and so there's kind of this like, I don't know, social responsibility, but also a part of me that always, you know, yeah, that's great. We get things like this pretty easily, but what, why don't more people create, not things like this exactly, but, you know, this. Um, so I, for the last five years, I like left, I don't design circuits um, anymore. And I went back to Brazil and started teaching, uh, mostly in art centers, because those are the people that were interested in having more, let's say, creative or open-ended explorations of technology. You know, I, I, um, we, you know, I can teach like the technical stuff, but there's always a bit of, of like, yes, this is how it's done and this is what you need to know, but what do we really want out of these things? Not just <coughs> how, how can we reprogram this? Um, and so, in those like meanderings in and out of art institutions, sounds like prison, right? <laughs> like I've been coming in and out of art institutions. Um, been developing a bit of my own practice. Mm. And most of it, it doesn't have a like, maybe a traditional kind of lineage or uh, history, but it, most of it is collaborative. A lot of it happens in public space, whether it's physical or virtual. Um, and a lot of it happens with other people. So I don't, um, I always find it, it's more fun to work together with other people because that's, I was just talking about this before starting that even though we have these cool technologies, it's a way to connect or it's a way to do things, but at the end of the day, I think we're fulfilling some kind of basic need for connecting, right? So um, why not also do that physically? And that's why I think something like this is pretty cool. Like this experience that you guys are having here, I think more important than the works that you're doing. And even though that's all really cool, like being able to talk to each other and spend the night and um, just see what else everyone else is feeling and, and thinking about um, those are the spaces that things like this has sort of been where I learned to express myself, I guess. So, um, I've been doing for maybe three years now, um, I'm part of a collective that's mostly based in Mexico, although we're like Starbucks now, we're everywhere. Um, so there's me here in the UK, there's a guy in France, uh, we had someone in Germany for a while, but there's always a base in, in Mexico City for us to go back to. Um, and I think, yeah, when I was thinking about all the stuff, like what to do with <coughs> um, my knowledge of technology, how to apply it, how to show it, express myself, all this, um, I met them and it was like, oh, we're actually talking about the same stuff. I'm Brazilian, you're Mexican, it's great. Um, <coughs> If nothing else, there's enough drama to, <laughs> to just keep, the, to keep the, the thing interesting. So I started working with them, and I'll just show some of the, the things that we've been doing, and uh, you'll see what I mean by like, public and collective uh, spaces. Um, so this was a project that we did in 2012. Um, And the name of it is the Telemetic Sound Weapon. And kind of references some of the stuff that the cybernetic people were talking about in the 60s, but in a very, very simple way, what this is was a way to translate um, kind of virtual movements and virtual messages that were happening on Twitter into a physical force in a public space. So 
what it is really is a washing machine motor uh, attached to a bunch of cables and pieces of metal that then got set up in this metal tube um, structure. Like the big tubes were already there. They're used to hang big posters in front of a uh, art center in a park. And this art center in the park also happens to be in front of a very big military base. And the military base has, depending on which uh, political party is in power, uh, it has different kinds of activities that it likes to do, but at some point in its past, it, it was a site for disappearances, or they were involved in disappearing people. And when this happened, um, there were certain things that were coming up about the, those events that happened in the 70s. So there was a lot of talk on Twitter about this military base, and we thought, why don't we translate that into something physical? So we put this washing machine motor in front of their <laughs> in front of the military base and I'll play a short video just to get the, oh, might not hear the sound so well, but uh, anytime somebody mentioned this base on Twitter, it would swing it and make a lot of noise. So <coughs> hence the And it lasted for about three weeks, and we there were all, all kinds of little things happened in the, the, that that time. Uh, we had to go in a couple of times to plug it back in because I think people would unplug it, but mostly because they were annoyed by the sound. Um, we also heard that some of the the military people liked it, so they would keep tweeting about the base to to hear it. Um, and then the thing, though, that was interesting is that it got enough sort of uh, attention in the media that even after it was down, wait, let me find my, even after we had to take it down, people kept talking about the military base online or the hashtag that we were using, um, thinking that they were still, you know, doing the, the thing. But um, so it maybe extended some of that discussion a little bit. Um, it's hard to, to measure. We also thought that Twitter started like censoring us um, because it trended during the first week. It was like a trending topic and then it disappeared from that list. But um, we actually visited Twitter once and asked them about that. And they were just explaining to us their, the math that goes behind figuring out what gets the trend and what doesn't. And so we were, we were like, okay. Um, Another surprising thing um, about, you know, the internet and these companies is that they're, they're huge physical things. Like Twitter employs 8,000 people in San Francisco. So when, um, you know, you get to San Francisco and you're like, well, so-and-so works at Twitter. Let's go visit him. And people are like, wait, Twitter is a place? And you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You go and they have nice food and like nice coffee. Everything's free. It's like a magical place if you work there. Um, and, and, and so then you see sort of some of the structure and where those boxes come from. It all becomes kind of clear, you know. Like, oh. um, this, is another, this is another version of the same thing, but inside a truck. So then it was like, hey, now it's movable. We just need a truck so you can take it anywhere. So, so, there's a, and, and this is in this is in Mexico City. This is in a different city. Um, and so it was kind of fun to have it in a mobile unit. Um, so then another thing that happened because of that first project and other projects, people heard about us and they were like, oh, cool, you guys are digital artists. Maybe you want to visit, or maybe you want to participate in this DJ DJ festival that we're having. And we were like, what? I don't know, it's just not, okay, why not? <laughs> um, can we have some workshops before it? And they were like, yeah, we don't know what that means, but sure. Um, so we found a place, we uh, you know, put out calls on the internet, got people to come, and, um, and at the time there was an election that had just happened with all of the drama that accompanies that. And so 
during those workshops, we worked with, I think there were 40 of us, and kind of we drew out, and this was all great for me, because I don't, you know, Mexican history is not my forte, but um, talking about uh, a little bit of Mexican p political history and the more kind of radical and non, not so popular uh, movements that have happened in social movements in Mexico. And we did create a kind of audiovisual performance, but it had 40 people. <laughs> so when we showed up and they were expecting like a VJ and a DJ, we were like, sure, there's 40 of us. We only need one audio plug and one <laughs> video plug, but there's going to be a lot of us on stage. And because, yeah, so this was us, you know, kind of talking about all the stuff that went into it. And this is us on stage. There were maybe six of us on computers, but there was a band, there were dancers, there was poetry being read. And this um, also has happened in other uh, times where we get invited to do something. And it's always a bit weird because as much as we like these opportunities to make our work public, it's probably, you know, galleries and museums and DJ festivals or whatever. Um, it's probably not where we think is the most um, you know, practical, useful, or meaningful field to, to be actuating. But there are opportunities for sure. So we always say yes, and then we sneak in everybody else with us, you know. So it's um, an interesting way to kind of also break down some of the... Uh, I don't know, a lot of the baggage that comes with institutions and certain museums and certain galleries and I, I'm not sure we've been doing that at fact necessarily, but um, at least in, in, in Mexico and um, to some extent it's been fun and interesting. Um, so then this is... Um, The, the project with the, with the washing machine, right? It was cool. Um, and it was the first time we, I think it was the first time I signed up for, I used Twitter. Like I had to sign up for an account just so I could like catch the hashtags and turn it into motor movements. And so um, it was okay. I still up until now have eight followers on Twitter and I might follow three. So, but I use it to do things like this. Mm. And um, and at the time, it, it, you know, it's cool. It has a purpose to like <coughs> communicate with people, get people out, um, promote certain things. But we also been thinking a lot about these structures and um, both kind of physical and invisible structures that are behind the interfaces that we use to communicate. And so, what um, we started we are doing a couple of projects that involve um, programming and creating our own, our own parallel sorts of networks and then attaching different kinds of things to those parallel networks. So it, one, one thing that we've done that's very practical um, wasn't really for like uh, an art event or, or an exhibition, but uh, there are certain types of routers that you can change so that they function as not just a way to distribute like a Wi-Fi network, but you can also put certain files on them so they act as like a server. So you could have this little router that can distribute files and it just lives here. Um, what you can also do is put a little website on it that serves the function sort of like Twitter where people can connect to it and communicate with each other like a chat, except it's not connected to the internet. So it will only work given like a very specific radius. Um, and so that was something that we looked at and used at a couple of different manifestations in Mexico and Brazil. So on the street, you, instead of using your you know Twitter to tell people where to go or what's happening, there was kind of like a local network that could be used to communicate and I'm sure, yeah, people, anyone could connect to it, but there's no history. Once it's turn, turned off, it's gone. It's not something that can be, you know, poked into by 
whoever. Um, and so there are some projects that then kind of came out from, from those experiences. And one is this called This Is Not The Internet, uh, which involved creating a website that was <laughs> meant to look like a mashup of an official government website in Mexico plus BuzzFeed. Um, do you guys know what BuzzFeed is, right? The 10 reasons for going to Denmark or whatever. Um, except the posts, um, which were also created collaboratively through like workshops and meetings with uh, writers and journalists and artists, um, were things like the 500 reasons why Telmex is crap or the 12 ways in which companies are selling your personal data um, and, you know, with the official government seal on top. So this site does exist on the real, you know, the internet, um, and that's where people would go to submit the posts. And then after a while, what we did is we downloaded that site to a router, uh, and then we did it to many routers. And then we went to the center of Mexico City where there's quite a lot of museums coffee shops and kind of like community centers and we just plug them in and so now there's a bunch of networks called free internet or telmax or whatever and when people connect to it and they think they're accessing facebook or twitter or whatever they want to access they get this um so it's a little bit of this like you know disruptive or um interve intervention or occupation of the um virtual space of, of, of downtown Mexico City. And I'm sure right away people figured it out and moved on to the real internet, but at least for a second, like we had them there. <laughs> um, and this is somewhat specific to Mexico, but I mean, the, um, because they're one of the richest people in the world is this guy that owns the phone companies in Mexico. He actually owns a lot of them all over the world now and part of the New York Times. And so a lot of, um, so it's, oh, another one of the posts on this thing was, you know, take the quiz and figure out which monopolist you are. But there's always like one answer, right? So, um, and, and he gives free internet in a lot of parts of Mexico City. So we were kind of like bumping up on his territory there. Luckily nobody got shot. Um, And so this is kind of like us playing with mm, internet related things and communication types of technologies. Um, and also having this kind of open, um, uh, open space, I guess, for people to come into our projects and change it, you know, because I think for this, we started with the rough idea, but um, not just the specific, the specific posts, but then kind of making it look like an official website. I think at some point we wanted to make like a digital zine. And, and so just being able to open it to other people to participate and grow and maybe afterwards, you know, people will, will take that and do something else with it um, is a little bit part of our process, which I don't know how many people here are familiar with open source software or have heard about what that is. Um, so you can, um, most of the, most of the software, I guess, that we run, like Photoshop or Microsoft Word or some browsers, uh, you, all you can do is run it and use it, right? There's some software like the, I think a lot of the stuff that Google is doing, inclu including their browsers, the Android operating system, you can download the programs and run it, or you can also download the code that generated the program, and you can change it. Um, and it's how a lot of software actually gets started, um, and there's a lot of very kind of robust software that, that is developed like that. So someone starts it, other people go <coughs> in, and they take that on. Um, and I think there's some of that that has influenced some of these projects. You know, we start things, and <laughs> We bring in people, if they like it, then they take it, and who knows, maybe someone's going to start a company about this. Um, hopefully not. But, um, and, but a lot of them have, been, have had to do with 
communication technologies. And in the last couple of years, I don't think I'm the only one that has had this feeling of that this battle has kind of been lost. The communication stuff and the, um, the internet as we know it, um, everybody suspected it, but given the amount of tapping and the amount of snooping and the kinds of technology that have been developed to like eavesdrop on you, it has just been like mind blowing, blowing even for people that kind of knew about it. Um, and so, not to say that there's no, um, no use in, in knowing this, it's super important to, to still use it, question it, you know, play with it, but maybe there are other fields as well that have been, that are kind of marching in a similar direction or that maybe feel open or feel like there could be some more exploration to be done about it before it gets turned into um, just products. And uh, we, the collective got invited to do a bit of a mobile residency last summer uh, <laughs> in kind of the border region between Mexico and the US and then up north through the New Mexico state of the US. And it's a completely bizarre place, both geographically. So it's got um, both red sand desert and white sand desert. Um, it's got mountains, it's got, uh, well, very diverse like fauna and, and fauna. Um, but it has also been the site of, and it, it's funny how they clash and how they mix, but that region, it's very strange to say whether you're American or Mexican because there are Mexicans north of the border and Americans south of the border. There are some people that don't even know the border exists. Um, and on top of that, uh, it has been the site of nuclear missile tests and it's also where space shuttles have gone up and landed throughout the I think the 80s they stopped doing it now um, but 70s and 80s and well and UFOs it's also where people see a lot of UFOs um, and so driving through this region oh and also different kinds of like native cultures that are in the area still and they're they're the ones that don't really know about the border, really. Um, and so driving through this region and seeing these sites that like now are parks, but it's where they used to test bombs and where they film Transformers now. You, the, the little pamphlet that you get when you walk in is sort of funny because it's like, if you see this, this, and this, don't touch it. Um, and some of the things are like, you know, bombs and missile things. Some of it is native artifacts that have some kind of value. And some of it is like, maybe Hollywood left some stuff and, you know, don't touch it because <laughs> they're going to come back for it. Um, uh, the UFO Museum is, uh, they, they're very serious, um, despite having things like this. And the thing that we <coughs> learned about them that was actually kind of interesting is that most of the work that they do is about debunking UFO theories, because then it makes their theories a lot more you know, reliable, I guess. Um, and this is also out there, the large, very large array, uh, which is one way that, you know, NASA communicates with deep space. Um, and that's another view of the same thing. And so um, when we were going through this and thinking about space and the stars and these things, not just as, or, an open space for interpretation, um, space exploration and the stars. Given how many people are in this region looking at stars for different reasons, um, including some kind of bizarre commercial ones, right? Like uh, space, uh, moon, moon visits, moon tourism, like is a thing coming up, um, made us kind of realize how the thing that kind of happened with the internet is a specific instance of something more general. 
Um, and there's a little bit of, uh, not responsibility, but um, just something that if we don't kind of state claims to certain spaces, that then they just get used for whoever has the biggest stick, right? Or the loudest voice or the most money. And so when that happens, um, it's something that we're calling the the effects of you know the industrialization on our social imaginary because if you oh, and I'll show yeah um, this is right after the trip through the desert I went back to Brazil and I was looking through some like comic books and stuff and I found one that had this which um, this guy sees the thing about you know some TV program about stars and gets in his head that he wants to I guess know more about stars goes to buy a telescope, binoculars, can't do it. And then he finds the Brazilian solution, which is just a hammock. Um, and so to, to what's kind of interesting about this is that this isn't a kid's comic book, right? And um, that right away in a lot of cultures, the idea of stars is connected to technology and money. Um, and this was exactly on the other side of this comic, it's a Brazilian ast astronaut getting to some planet and, and claiming it for Brazil. Um, we don't really have, Brazil doesn't have like a space program that can do this, but again, it's part of the imaginary to do this just because this is what the Americans and the Russians did. And so, and when you look at science fiction from other countries, a lot of it looks like what the Americans and the Russians did. Um, and so that's what we're talking about, how some of these technological things influence the social imaginary. And we want to try to kind of reverse that or at least create some processes or something that can question um, these un not unclaimed spaces. I mean, some, a lot of outer space is actually claimed. So, um, so we... Um, visited one NASA base at some point, but just read a lot about it online and were kind of like as a way to connect some of this to the previous work that we have done. Uh, we're really intrigued by their projects involving laser modems. And the, the way that NASA sends things or the way that they receive things from the International Space Station now is through a laser beam. So they shoot a laser because the thing goes by so fast. It's like over Pasadena for four seconds. And in those four seconds, they just shoot down some, you know, 400 gigs of data. So they do it because it's really fast. Um, <coughs> it's also a reliable way to send data really far, more than like radio or Wi-Fi, if you have a good laser. Um, and so we started working on our terrestrial version of this, not so much to communicate with outer space, but maybe there are things on Earth that have large distances between them, whether they're physical or maybe political. Um, we started like working on these laser transmitters that would, initially the idea was to shoot data across the border, the US-Mexico border. Um, what's funny is that after working on this for a little bit, um, I was actually, I think this summer, Facebook released a video showing these gigantic airplanes that they're working on. I don't know if this sounds familiar. Um, they're making really, really big fi fiber glass or fiber, what's that called? Is this fiber? Fiberglass. Fiberglass, yeah, yeah, yeah. fiberglass um, unmanned airplanes. And the idea is to fly them above probably South America, Africa, and Asia, and transmit the internet down to people. But the way that the planes are gonna communicate with each other and with the satellites is using lasers. So they copied us, um, and, or NASA, right? It's all, um, but it was, it was interesting to kind of see us, like we're playing with this and all of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, there is kind of also a very practical and very like militaristic way of, of or use for the same thing. Um, and 
their their airplanes are actually kind of scary because their lasers align automatically. Ours is, this is what ours sort of look like at the end. <laughs> um, it has some gears, but you manually have to go up there and kind of align them. Um, and it's uh, right now it's set up in in a gallery in in Texas, and it, it is one of these things that it's like a lot of the project is not really about this object or this communication that we're doing inside the gallery um, because we did want to shoot it across the border but when we got there and started talking to people learning a little bit more about the region um, like I was saying it wasn't so clear that that border right there is such a difficult thing to to cross um, in terms of, of uh, let's say if you're in the Mexico side, you have access to radio stations that are in the American side or the internet that's in the American side and vice versa. So it's not like internet is a lot cheaper in one side and it exists and it doesn't exist on the other side. And when we started talking to people about what would you do if you could do this, um, it didn't seem like this had have a lot of meaning um, to, to set up. But um, what was interesting in those conversations and those like workshops and and talking to different groups was um, the idea of redefining network and data and transmission and maybe thinking of more physical ways of carrying things across the border and not just physically but also thinking of ways where we can maybe communicate with the future um, using lasers still so what we ended up doing was modifying a laser cutter to etch messages onto rocks. Um, so we grabbed a bunch of rocks on both sides of the border. This is just like a little sketch of a circuit diagram that we were doing for testing. Um, but through the workshops, we came up with a couple of themes and tried to map out their past, present, and future. Um, of things that were important for the people in those regions that had to do with technology or the military presence or the border itself or economics. Um, those were the things that kind of came up uh, on both sides. And what, because we're thinking about uh, communicating with ourselves in the future, we created kind of um, headlines for these events that we thought about, uh, what might be in the paper in 100 years, uh, and then used some computer programming to turn those phrases into kind of hieroglyphics. And we came up with this because it was, it's kind of nice looking and it was, there's a way to encode it and decode it. But then we looked up crop circles online and there's a lot that look like this. <laughs> Um, so maybe there's a way to decode crop circles as well, but we didn't, um, and so, yeah, so this is just the little, like, web program that we made to turn headlines into, into hieroglyphics, and then we just etched them into a bunch of different kinds of rocks, um, and right now they're sitting on, uh, a gallery in Texas and a university in the Mexican side. But in, I think in a month, um, there's going to be an event where people come and take the rocks and either cross the border with them or take them out into the wild to, or leave them in their house or whatever. Because in 200 years, we want geologists to find this and be like, what the, f <laughs> what is, when is this from? Um, uh, because the other thing we learned is that in that region, a lot of the older native tribes that lived there were very nomadic and so the same tribe would come through the region but with a hundred years apart and so they find these things there that they date it and it's like wow this one date and then they they find another one and they date it and they're like there's a hundred years of difference and so now we're just adding to that <laughs> um although we didn't copy any specific you know we came up with our own kind of digital analog uh writing system um and so, yeah, so this is kind of one of these, you know, 
fresh because it's, it's up and who knows what's going to happen when people are allowed to take the things out of the gallery and, um, and, and a lot of them want to take it home and keep it as like a souvenir and we're like, wow, come on. <laughs> that's not <laughs> but that's cool too because eventually they'll leave that somewhere and we'll confuse people either way. Um, and so that, these are the like the collective tech uh, art public works that I do with this with this group in Mexico um, globalized and uh, so yeah so that's what I had for the presentation today so I don't know if anyone has questions or you could have actually shouted them during the presentation I didn't I didn't mention it but I'm pretty this is pretty informal so um, yeah okay, so um, basically your work is kind of like science technology art how do you think how that like when you know to, because even now like the new theory is the, the earth is flat mm -hmm. NASA is unreal like you see um, <laughs> space actor is that where the combinational astronaut space actor so basically okay. they were the proof at them um, you know all the clothes that they're wearing is made from China just to make it look spectacular and they're not <laughs> They're not literally flying to the moon or anything. They're all um, production from the film, from the Hollywood. And even so even so now? Now, yeah. Yeah, and okay. On the YouTube, there are so many theories about it. Yeah. And then um, when you fly on the airplane, you never see the curve of the Earth. No. <laughs> it's always flat. <laughs> you know, it's like, and then there are so many scientists that, like, approve this and, like, more than 80% vote at the the earth is flat uh, and NASA is unreal, it's, it's productive that America make it up. Yeah. So I bet you have a lot of hustling <laughs> in your work. To convince. The laser wasn't real, you said, you know, all that telecom that go onto the space yeah, is all made up. The, face, the Facebook one might be real. That's because it's like 1,000 <laughs> like and 10,000 company and, and think about it, everyone send the um, satellite onto the space. So how come that another satellite is not sit in the front of your satellite? <laughs> so how can you get a clear picture or no waving or? Well, for for that one, the <laughs> might... <laughs> scientists, I wouldn't arguing with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so one thing I'll, I'll mention though is that, um, and it, it may or may not answer whether the Earth is flat or not. But <laughs> there's uh, there's a very specific location in space. Um, called, I forget what it's called, um, but it's like so-and-so's belt. And it's where the satellites are far enough from the Earth so that they rotate at the exact same speed as the Earth. Geostationary. The geostationary, yeah. But there's like, it's some dude's name, like Asimov's belt. Um, but um, So that's a very, and it's right above the equator as well, because that's how, you know, the axis in which the Earth rotates. And those are very good spots to put your your satellite because you know they're going to be above a certain part of the earth all the time so telecommunications and those guys cameras you know that that's where they have them um but if you look at the map the countries that are actually crossed by the equator none of them have a powerful enough space program to put satellites there so in the 70s they got together and tried to form some kind of coalition to claim that space in outer space and the bigger you know the bigger countries were like yeah whatever cute uh, and then they went out there and filled it with satellites and there are so many satellites out there that um, they can't easily destroy one of them because it would affect the ones next to it yeah. even though they're kilometers apart right like once something starts moving in space it doesn't stop so I, 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 we'll get to that. So, um, the, there are these decommissioned satellites that are out there that were put out there in like the 80s and they're not encrypted. So you could listen to them. Um, and what has happened more recently with people that are in some of those countries that, that are crossed by the equator is that, and this usually kind of comes out of like art centers and, and art 
research, people started building their own space agencies. Um, and so I think, I forget which one it is in Africa. It might be the Congo Space Agency or um, the Kenya Space Agency, that they have these fantastic photos that they, they take of people in outer space, except it's in, in Africa. Um, and so I, whether all of NASA is, <laughs> is a fantasy, um, there are other people trying to claim the, the how do you, um, the kind of creative territory, you know, that, that maybe NASA took over with Hollywood. Um, and so I think that's how I'm going to leave that so one. So how would you do the same with NASA doing right now? Are you trying to create something to, to make us believe? I, I'm not trying to, to make anyone believe that, that you know, we are going to... You've got your lots of views. You've got theory. And then, hmm. Yeah. But... It's a new knowledge. Or trying to get more people to, to participate in some of these questions, you know, um, and, and understand some of the technologies and understand some of the maybe geopolitical implications of claiming space, you know, putting satellites above um, certain territories. And although that one's also a really hard one to be, um, to participate in, you know, it's not like it's easy to put a satellite in space, although there are also art collectives working on that. So. And just like the satellites out in space that are just sort of there now and you can't take them away, these things are just going to sit there. Yeah. I I think it 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 is, and I think that the things that do go up now kind of tend to have a plan to get them out um, mm -hmm. eventually or safely. But there's enough of it out there that um, is just sort of stuck there, I guess. And then yeah, and and it is a battle of like. Oops, we blew up this thing and maybe yeah. destroyed your thing. Sorry, it wasn't, you know, it's uh, space exploration. Uh. <laughs> um, but the ocean, I think, is another one of these. And the James Cameron, the guy from Titanic, is, is uh, one of these, like, kind of crazy uh, people. Well, I guess he's, he's pretty good at making movies, but then he's been talking about, how, you know... He, yeah. He wants to go the deepest and furthest and all this stuff. Probably, yeah. yeah. Um, and it is another kind of contested space, right? Um, in some ways, maybe open maritime law. I don't know how that works, but in movies, it's always where people go to not get caught and all this stuff. And then there's the, the, the depth as well, which is huge. Um, plus, it's where a lot of trash is ending up in yeah. some ways. And um, so, yeah. We'll, Does it scare you? Is that the 
this, yeah. not what I make, but then how it connects to other stuff and what other people make is usually what is carrier. And like learning about it by doing it, um, it makes the technology less scary, but then these other systems show up, you know, it's like, oh, you had this technology that could have been used for this, 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 or that. You chose that one. And then that history is what tends to scare me, you know? So like learning about these countries getting together and being like, we want that space. And other people just being like, nope, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, that's the part that's usually scarier. Does that, does that change what you, well, before you said you're an engineer. Yeah. So does that ever change what, you, what you'd work on because you're scared of what they could be? No, what actually, uh, I mean, there were many things that made me kind of leave what I was doing, like I was in the U.S., I was, you know, working on something very, very specific, uh, but if I could say like a specific anecdote about it that made me quit was the PlayStation 2, I think, or 3, because we were a tiny company, but we were doing stuff with the factory that makes the chips for the PlayStation. And so when October would come by, we would just have these massive rushes and super stress and all this stuff because the factories all of a sudden had to be ready to print the PlayStation chips. And so being in Pittsburgh and being like, why do I care about the PlayStation in Taiwan? You know, it's like a Japanese company, a factory in Taiwan, I'm in the US. And it was just like, Shh. I'm starting to hate Christmas, you know, like, um, and well, and, and, and then again, the sort of invisible thing of like consumerism around Christmas, but, and so it, and, and if I had to like give a reason for quitting, it's like PlayStation 2, uh, or whatever was coming out in 2007 or 8, uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that one, <laughs> um, is it difficult then to be part of a collective that is so far away? Yeah, because despite being able to talk to any of them right now, um, when it's time to like, oh, let's all get together and do something, or let's all... And, and then also having Latin American work uh, rhythms um, is also can get in the way as well. But, um, and, and, but on the other hand, that's also a little bit part of the experience of learning to let go of certain things, of being, yeah, if I wanted to do this my way, I would be by myself doing it. And so there's some negotiating. It's the closest I've ever been to being in a band. And so I can <laughs> be like, oh yeah, when you know, Justin Timberlake went solo, I totally understand that. Um, <laughs> so. <laughs> no, so I have, uh, I studied ele electronics and then one, uh, one person's a designer, uh, studied design, and one studied like fine art. He was a painter for a while. Uh, the other one was more of like a video maker. Um, and those are the <laughs> backgrounds of the more active members. So, and it's funny because I don't think I'm the best, if, I mean, you know, wh whatever that might mean, but, um, I'm not the most up-to-date programmer in the collective. Someone else that, you know, the painter guy actually knows a lot more about web programming and, and that stuff. Uh, so it's, it's quite interesting to be like, whatever arguments we get into, you know, when there's the two of us versus the four of us versus six or, um, and I think that's also part of the, the interesting uh, aspect of it to, no. Um, it fluctuates, but um, from being half to three quarters men. But um, yeah. So you tell yourself now to ten. It depends, okay. <laughs> um, because um, it, like I was saying, that I feel like some of of my practice, it definitely has. There are precedents in, in you know art history and and, and new media stuff and uh, but personally I I don't have that 
history, let's say, or that lineage, or um, and so. But I do, the, you know, because now I'm an artist in residence, at fact. Um, but there might be times when what I'm doing is um, more like design work or education work, and so you have to be able to say, "Ah, oh, I'm an artist, designer, engineer, educator." Uh, <laughs> and so, depending on on how many boxes you can tick, you know, on the on the thing. Um, and but yeah. Um, what do you what do you resonate as part of fact as genius versus character? Is not they're not a fact, but some of the laser stuff um, I was doing a fact because we have a space to play with electronics and access to a three D printer, mm -hmm. uh, a laser cutter in one of the universities in Liverpool. Yeah. So that's where I was going to kind of like, can we actually, you know, etch rocks? How easy is this? How <coughs> how good is it going to look um, and so some of this was was then in fact and then there's another project that I'm working with with the, the other guy that's at fact that I I'll show it quickly because it has um, so this is a 3d rendering of it but then when we build the real thing, it actually looked like 3D rendering, which is kind of scary. Um, and it's work in progress. Like, it just looks like a bunch of metal and motors and wires right now. But what we're trying to do is give, um, give phones, but eventually it could be other objects, ways of communicating that are not for humans. So giving them their own, um, in this case, it's like body language, and they also make noises at each other. Um, they recognize each other and move according to what is they're doing and we don't understand them um, and so and you know at some point we had to program those things onto them but we you can also program things <coughs> that then later learn things and so that's what we're moving towards and so uh, we're slowly working on this and might have something to show in a month, and we'll try to to do that in Liverpool. Um, is this like what your residence is like? I don't know what you're saying. Like, like, um, is it um, it's like the aesthetic that comes up? Is this not really? Uh, so when I started thinking about this in particular, what um was curious to me was the thing I mentioned, how you know, we've evolved the sound, we have so many ways of moving, but then we just like kind of touch our phones. And I suspect that they're having a lot more fun than we are yeah. because they have GPS and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and it must be like being tickled to them, you know? Um, so that's how that started. But then um, showing it and talking to people, depending on where and who they are, people are like, oh, this has totally to do with the object-oriented ontologies and um, Ian Bogos and all that and other people were like no this is more of like the new materialistic and post-humanist and anthropocentric scene non-anthropocentric da, da, da. and so we actually started a reading group at FACT to try to read up on these things with um, some of the PhD students in the area that know more about it uh, than us and we had one meeting, and the next one is coming up. So if anyone's interested as well. I'm not a PhD student. No, none of us are. Um, <laughs> I just read on the internet, and then go, oh, shit, I need to find Yeah. And actually, last time, there was a guy that came to visit FACT and stayed for the reading group. And I think he was so confused afterwards <laughs> that he came up to me, and he was like, what, are, what did he ask? He was like, where? where are we or why are we here or something and I was like oh because we had the group and and then I later realized that he was actually in a more like existential level he was like why are we on earth and I was like oh I don't know <laughs> um, I'm glad you had this experience here but sorry <laughs> um, and so I'll um, I guess I'll send a link about some of these things or it might be on the fact website by now it's called reading and thinking Mm -hmm. And if anyone's in the area um, and wants to come for that, is is super welcome. Um, and do you want to might want to send me an email beforehand so you get like the readings because we do like. How far away is it? Because I didn't actually realize I'm like several hours away. 
Oh, we're in Liverpool. <laughs> we're in Liverpool. Um, yeah, so it's like two hours from here. So from here, yeah. It's, it's, oh, it's just not as far. Because you already have a place going in where it's hope people from like the Liverpool FCA. Uh-huh. Right, so here people from like the only like really frequently stalking mm. their discussions. But yeah, it'd be interesting because the stuff that you're doing, this is just really cool. <laughs> Uh, so the the one coming up is the twenty twenty eighth of January, if that's a Thursday. I keep getting January and February mixed up. Twenty yeah, eighth. Yeah. <coughs> so the twenty eighth. And you guys have experience like sleeping in cold, open spaces. <laughs> yeah, yeah <laughs> totally stay in our house. Yeah, it's like. <laughs> um, so yeah, I'll send I'll send links to you. Yeah, yeah. And, I'll yeah. And so. How long do you that? Uh, me for another two months, because at the end of February, it will mark a year that I've been there, and the exhibition that's up now uh, has to go down. And the next one that comes up, they need all the gallery spaces. And so there's not going to be a physical space for our lab. Um, and then it's not so clear what I would be doing, in fact. And so um, it will, yeah. So, but we'll see. There's two months to see if something, some other space or something else. But, um, and the other guy there, he'll stick around longer and develop some curriculum with schools and he'll maybe be teaching some stuff still but yeah I think I'll be gone yeah, but, um, I think going back to Brazil um, this pipe uh, when I so I went to university in the US then I went back to Brazil then when the World Cup was coming up I went back to the US to California for a little bit to escape from the World Cup and now that's gone and I want to go back to Brazil, but the Olympics are coming up. Um, so with everything that comes with that, um, but, but I think we'll be, yeah, I'm going to end up in Brazil. I'm from Sao Paulo and lived there most of the time that I lived in Brazil, but um, spent a little bit of time in a city called Belo Horizonte, which, is, uh, which I like a lot. So, yeah. Did it? Yeah. 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 The, so there are these satellites that the U.S. put up in the 80s that um, were, they're just repeaters. And so they get, you can transmit, <coughs> you transmit information in a frequency and then you read it back at a different frequency. And if you have, you can do it with certain kinds of walkie-talkies because the frequency to receive is open. Um, and if you know where to point, you have to build an antenna and you can do it with like bamboo. And, and you know where to point. Um, you can listen to mostly... If you do this, I'm not sure if it extends to here, but in the Americas, you mostly listen to Brazilian truck drivers <laughs> and Colombian businessmen <laughs> um, uh, talking. They, they're mostly excited that it actually works. Um, but so imagine like a chat room, except it's over American satellites and people being like, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, can you hear me? Great. It's like, where are you? Oh, somewhere. And, um, and we were never able to actually transmit in those frequencies when we tried, but apparently it's just a matter of pointing an antenna and... Um, For Ant's thing, it's just that he logged into like, Facebook, so whenever he liked, he liked it, it blew the balloon up. Mm -hmm. Forget, can anyone do that if you know what you're doing, or it's not so like... Yeah, because there's... It's like, you get your access to it. Yeah. Each, 
each company like Facebook and Twitter and all those have a slightly different process where you can access that kind of data but they want you to access it because that's how then other companies use that data you know so they're collecting it from us and kind of making it available to people that write apps or people that make advertisement or people like us as well so there are ways to, to get to it um, and they're all slightly different so sometimes it's like oh I just spent all this time to make Facebook work and now Twitter mm. and then a month from now they change it um, and and if you really need to use it you can also pay them to have like a simpler experience gathering data so um, yeah again you start sort of exposing these like corners of Facebook that you didn't know existed and yeah we're also teaching that at fact the with the exhibition now because the exhibition now is called follow and it's about fame on the internet and sort of social media as a way to uh, what's, the, what's the word um, showcase yourself or <laughs> and so we're, we're having a couple of classes about how to access that data as a person or artist you know not not a company so yeah this is not an advertisement <laughs> okay. okay by the way So at least for some of the work that we do with the collective, and this is, yeah, you, you can document sort of the action, right? Or the project and how it went and the workshops. Um, and then there's always, it ends up taking a lot of time to document the technology in a way that is the, the ideas are expressed in there and not just the actual like code. Uh, and I'm not sure that we do the best job at that, but certainly try. Um, and there are websites, and they're kind of like other types of social media. There's one called GitHub, for example, that's where you share code. So it's like the Facebook of programmers. Um, and if, it, like the open source stuff that I was talking about, that's where you put your code, other people look at it, they modify it, they send it back to you. And then you can start following people and liking things. Um, GitHub. Um, oh, yeah. no, my history. Ah. <laughs> uh, so that's this is like the the nerdiest Facebook that you'll ever <laughs> go on. Um, you can only put one image, you know, and that should be like. Um, a, a tip as to how nerdy this is. Um, and so this is one place where, for example, our collective has all the stuff that we've worked on. But here is just the raw code, and you're right. If you take this and try to run it later, it might not work. Um, but we uh, try to have pieces of our, our website be devoted to um, let's see <coughs> how the thing was built like the circuit and also some of this stuff goes in and out of style um, but kind of explain exactly what the parts are so that then someone can replicate it with other technologies um, it's not full proof you know there's and, and maybe we'll all be communicating using brain waves in a couple of years. There's no needs for laser. But uh, it's, yeah, it's something that is surprisingly a lot more work than, and I, I do personally try to, to invest in that because I think it's important. Uh, that's 
I can show one more video. Just I don't know if people have to rush back to anything. Um, so this is also something else, because my Hadamas couldn't come. This is one of the things that we work together and somehow is connected as to how I ended up at FACT. Um, there's a couple of different centers or buildings in the world that have these digital facades. It's just the front of the building covered in LEDs. And there's a couple of festivals about or that they invite artists to participate and make artwork for this gigantic screen, basically. Um, and a lot of people spend a lot of time making things that are really complicated and pretty and on their computer screen. And then when you put it on the building, it has like 300 pixels by 200 pixels. And it's just completely, you, you can't understand what it is. And so uh, we got invited to participate in one of these things in Brazil. And we're like, what's the simplest thing that we can do? And we're like, why don't we just make it flash white every time that someone uses our camera? Um, so we had a camera on the street. And whenever people took a picture using it, the whole building was, there's no need for, um, was the flash. And we wanted it for people to kind of, more than taking the picture and seeing the image later, what they would remember is that experience, right? It was like, oh, I used the biggest flash in the world. Um, and so this is our, this is the building. Um, and the people that organized the thing wouldn't let us give out a camera to people to touch. They were like, oh, they're going to steal it, break it. And like, all right. So we had to put it on a tripod and then people would have to come up and and it would just like take pictures of them automatically whenever they hit it. Um, and so there was also a mirror <laughs> sitting in front of the building. So it was also, if no one's there, the building's just taking selfies. And then when people <laughs> step in, they, they are, uh, they're part of the, of the experience. So that's the mirror, like showing the building. And people would just do the craziest things. Like there was this couple that was celebrating their 40th anniversary and they reenacted their whole relationship in front of this thing. Um, there was a lot of making out. Um, and a lot of kind of back and forth with the people that were organizing this thing because they were like, but then it's going to be off? And I was like, no, it's going to be flashing. It's not going to be off. People will get it. Don't worry, you know? And they're like, no, it's going to look like it's broken. And I was like, no, it's, it looks like it's broken when you're showing like movies, you know, and you can't tell what is happening. It looks like it's broken. But, so. And then we also invited people to submit different kinds of flashes uh, but I don't think anybody did. So if they wanted to like have some other kind of thing that would flash. Um, what's that? Yeah, like a shape, an image or something. But um, the people organizing it also had problems with that idea. Although we were going to do it anyways. It's just that um, no one ended up submitting things, I guess. But, So yeah, so that's my practice. If anyone's in Liverpool in the next two months, you're more than welcome to come to FACT Lab and hang out there. Uh, I'll send out links for all the events and stuff and you can just pick some favorite ones. And, um, you might not want to follow me on social media because then you just end up with, you know, being used in some project or something. But up to you. <coughs> yes, sir.